Good morning, everyone. Today, our topic of discussion, topic of discussion in parasitology, is strongyloidiasis. So, first of all, I would like to <clears throat> talk about strongyloidiasis. Maybe the parasitology, which the book which you are following, you will found strongyloids, sterco, sterco. Relis in that one. So basically, strongyloidiasis is caused by multiple like uh, strongyloids uh, parasites, but uh, the one which is written in most of the parasitology is strongyloids stercoralis. So it's an intestinal infection and uh, it's an intestinal infection. Remember guys, it's a nematode. You can say it's a nematode and causes intestinal infection. Now, again, the distribution is widespread throughout the tropics and subtropical region or subtropics. There are many people who are infected with this thing. This thing. The exact number is unknown, but estimated you can say 30 to 100 million are those who are infected. So, <laughs> basically this is like the people who are living in developing countries, they are most affected. But nowadays, of course, like the world is more like a global village. And um, traveling is very common, so that's why. The, it can be present anywhere, you can say. So... <clears throat> There are some endemic areas where this are, these are like commonly found. Um, what is the thing that uh, this condition can persist in the host for decades, for years and years and years? Like they have evidence of infection for more than 40 years which was documented in British soldiers uh, who were like the prisoners of war. <clears throat> I'm talking about the Second World War. So, now UK, like this condition is not endemic in UK. So that's why I'm talking about like, you know, the prisoners of war. So, Basically, these prisoners of war were, bring, were brought from the Thailand, which is a tropical or subtropical region. So, uh, that's why like, uh, I gave you this example. Um, now, guys, uh, uh, again, this infection is not limited to humans. It can infect the dogs also. And they also play a very important role in spreading the infection. So, and sometimes there could be outbreaks of this condition, and especially in the people who are animal handlers. And the thing is, like, there is human to human transmission um, is also detected. Um, especially in homosexual males. So, <laughs> but most of the infections, you know, they occurred. Um, mostly infections are caused by exposure to the soil. Okay. Now, so basically the soil is the one which is having the larva 
Okay, and of course, like I am talking about now stercoloids, stercorales, as I told you, like there are different kinds. But now, like uh, I'm typically I'm uh, talking about this one. There are other species as well, like uh, st st strongyloids, um, fuller borne. Okay, so that is present mostly in African monkeys, but. That's why right over here, Stercorales. So, um, this one is found in small intestine, and uh, this is the smallest nematode. Smallest nematode. I'm also saying smallest worm. It is the smallest nematode which can, which is found to cause human infection. Okay, smallest nematode. So some description about the causative organism I wanted to talk here is uh, this is the adult form you can see this is the egg of strongyloids stercoralis. Basically the majority of the infections are caused by stercoralis. As I told you there are other species as well like uh, Fuller borne. So they can also infect the humans, but like this one is more common, so that's why we are discussing this one. Like uh, this one, you know, um, strongyloids, um, fuel, sorry, fuel, fuely, fuely borny, uh, infects, infants, babies, in sub-Saharan African countries. Okay, and they cause a, a condition called as and they caused something called as swollen baby belly belly syndrome. So this one, this one, this infection occurs in, in children, right? So you can see this one, like, uh, you know, uh, how this one looks like, right? Strongylites, stercoralis, how it is, how it looks like. And why we talk about this thing, because, you know, this information is more important about for the, especially for the, people who have to see it and identify it okay so you can see the female worm worm and you can see the male worm the female is somehow thin and it is like 2.5 millimeter long and they have the esophagus you can see over here okay and you can see like they talk, talk about like they have anal opening as well as they have the vulva opening Okay. And the male worm here, they are showing you, uh, like this one is not as long as female, you can say a shorter. So this is how the male look like, this is how the female look like. So uh, the, the males are not seen in human infections by the way. And this is the eggs. And eggs are present within the uterus of the female. And each uterus contain like around eight to ten eggs, and they are oval in shape. Okay, and as soon as they lay the eggs, they hatch out, and this larva comes out and start its cycle. Okay, so now how the larva looks like, you can see over here. This is the larva of Strongyloid stercoralis. This is the repetitive form larva this one and this one is the flurry form larva so this is you can say the first stage larva okay and uh, it is the most common form of parasite found in the feces so when we found in when we check the stools of the patient we found this thing okay so uh, now they are quite smaller like around 
one fourth centimeter or 0.25 millimeter you can say and this is the flariform larva and this one is like uh, uh, you can see like longer than this one so this is how they look like now about the life cycle uh, I include here like two photographs one is this one and one is this one and as I told you like I like this one more than the other one because like here you can see you can see the infective stage you can see the diagnostic stage by the way both of them they are same like if you will see see here they are talking about the direct cycle here they are talking about the auto infection here they are talking about the indirect cycle and again the same thing the direct cycle indirect cycle and auto infection right so they are the same thing there is no difference you can say so you can see like they have like the parasitic cycle and they have the free living cycle both of them they are there so now uh, basically to start with the life cycle this strongyloid stercoralis exists in both a free form in the soil okay and they can also live as a parasitic form or you can say a intestinal parasite so they can be present in the free living form in the soil or they can be present in the intestines and the female parasites which are longer one they are semi-transparent they are colorless and now they are embedded or you can say they are completely attached within the mucosal epithelium of the proximal small intestine okay and there are jejunum and jejunum right so here they keep on laying eggs now a single female can produce up to 50 eggs per day okay now uh, simply uh, in, in males, like in intestines, we won't find any males, no male parasitic form, rather the females which are embedded in the mucosa and they lay around 50 eggs per day. Now the eggs, basically they hatch within the mucosa and emerge into the lumen of the small bowel as non-infectious rabidity form larva. As a non-infectious rabidity form you know like I will show you this one this is the rabidity form right so remember rabidity form are non-infectious okay so in that design like they are present as a rabidity form now this rabidity form larva can be excreted in the stool and in a warm humid environment mature and become a free living male adult okay you can see like okay i'm not starting from this one rather i started the story from the human you can see over here the flariform larva migrate by various pathways to the small intestine where they become adults and as i told you in the intestines the adults females are all only there and they keep on depositing eggs. Eggs are deposited in the intestinal mucosa and rabidity form larva hatch and migrate to intestinal lumen. And they keep on releasing it in the feces. So rabidity form larva in the intestine are excreted in stool, right? So in the stool, when the environment is warm, humid, they started living as a free living male adult and female worms. So you can say development into a free living adult form okay now the adult forms mate and the female again they started producing eggs okay and that after several molds ultimately become what ultimately become infectious flariform larva this one 
so see like reability form larva hatch from embryonated egg reability form larva developed into flurry form l3 larva this one is called as l1 this one is called as l3 and this reability form larva become adult one so infective flurry form larva penetrate the intact skin of the definitive host so you can see over here right so there is a alternate way as well that several free living cycles uh, like there are many free living cycles you know which can occur okay and develop like simply they develop into flariform larva now the flariform larva how it enters the human this is important so the flariform larva penetrate the intact skin leading to the parasitic phase of infection okay and after penetrating the skin the flariform larva migrate to the right side of the heart you know by the veins it, it, it uh, incredibly reaches the right side of the heart either through the lymphatics or through the venules and then to the lungs via the pulmonary circus of course the right heart is going to pop it into the lungs in the lungs the larva penetrate the alveoli they migrate into the tracheobronchial tree and then they are swallowed and once they are swallowed if they reach the smaller proximal small intestine and then the same story started okay now you can see like here is they are talking about the same thing I did not talk about the auto infection right now this right so they are talking about the same thing direct cycle indirect cycle and in the intestine what's going on the female keep on laying the eggs so the life cycle is quite easy so <coughs> one of the more you can say unusual feature of strongyloids is auto infection so what happens is like in the distal colon distal colon or in the perianal region here reability form larva can undergo transformation to flurry form larva this one okay now flurry form larva is the infectious one remember guys this thing so the flurry form larva which is present now in the perianal region or in the distal colon they penetrate the mucosa or the perianal skin and they again reinfect the host so this is basically called as auto infection so you can see auto infection reability form larva in the large intestine become flariform penetrate in cell mucosa for peri or for perianal skin and migrate to other organs so this is called as auto infection so this is the reason or why this process of auto infection this parasite can infect or can stay inside the host for decades okay and that's the reason of this auto infection like some of the patients they carry a very increased parasitic load because of auto infection so one thing you know we call in this thing is called as hyperinfection so what is hyperinfection this is a condition in which large number of reability form larva transform into flurry form larva they penetrate the mucosa of the colon and cause severe disease and this mostly occur in malnourished or you can say immunocompromised people okay uh so uh, that's the reason like anyone who is having infection with strongyloid sarcoidosis when we give them some immunosuppressants or if they get aids you know they are it is it, it they may have this hyper infection hyper infection syndrome so uh guys and like if you are good in immunity 
remember about the immune response like whatever is there you know whenever we get any infection any infection infection from the viruses any infection from the bacteria or any other infection what is there guys you know the immunity play are too much role and remember in parasites the thing is easy eosinophils will be raised mast cells will be released and t cell mediated immune response will come into action okay so of course eosinophilia is common in these patients okay uh, eosinophils you know they can kill the organisms as well so uh, basically eosinophils have ige receptors on their surface and uh, basically their cytotoxic effects are mediated through i IgE antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity and mast cells as you know we know like they have several functions um, against uh, parasitic infections mast cells promote peristalsis mast cell promotes mucus production which which helps in expelling the parasite from the body and also mast cells you know they release certain um, cytokines as well so these are the things so anyhow like this is the life cycle quite easy remember flariform are the one which are uh, the infective one and they can cause auto infection or they can cause hyper infection so the clinical findings or clinical features of this condition so if you will talk about the clinical features of strongy loid uh, loid um, we can divide the complication into um, cutaneous manifestations and pulmonary manifestations as well as intestinal and remember there is hyper infection as well in malnourished people so talking about uh, the clinical manifestations the important thing to mention over here is the clinical manifestations of uncomplicated strongyloidiasis are cutaneous pulmonary or intestinal or git so of course like first of all it penetrates the skin we all know right it penetrates the skin so remember whenever they penetrate the skin you know there can be localized uh, redness we call it as erythema erythema okay some of the people they have uh, pruritic like pruritus or pruritic rash because of itching okay so many of the people they have urticarial type of rash okay so like this urticarial rash urticarial rash you know it can, could be like very severe type and some of the people you know it can spread so fast like around 10 cm per hour you can say and this is mostly seen in buttocks perineum and thigh and it may represent the auto infection as well so remember like just now um the parasite it enter the skin so they have they will be having these kind of things right but now see the larva reaches the lungs okay or you can say within few days when the larva after the initial inf infection when the larva reaches the lungs so there will be pulmonary symptoms like cough um, um, wheezing um, shortness of breath okay all these things can develop as well as you know um, there can be pulmonary infiltrates on uh, um, imaging like ct scan and things like this so now uh, 
After that, of course, it will it is going to the GIT. And the GIT, you know, it will start with epigastric pain, for example. Like, go logically, right? And you don't have to remember all these things, right? Like, or uh, you can say there could be blotting, there could be nausea and vomiting, or nausea and diarrhea. Okay, things like this. So these, these will be features. And some of the patients, you know, they may show the features of malabsorption. or uh, malnutrition in chronic infections, okay? Okay, so the thing. Right? It could be like this, like the person may uh, don't have any kind of infection, may, may don't have any kind of manifestations, okay? Like they remain asymptomatic or you can say minimally symptomatic. So in most of the chronic infections, by the way, the symptoms resolve. And the only thing we can do is like the appearance of the larva in the stool, that's it. And even the radiological findings I told you about pulmonary infiltrates, you know, they are quite variable. You can say it range from no abnormality to many other things. Like sometimes the patient may have, uh, like if you will do a CT scan of the abdomen, maybe you will find such changes in the mucosa of the intestines as well. Okay, so all the things are there. There are somehow some non-specific symptoms of chronic strongyloidiasis okay like uh, peptic ulcer disease is one of them and uh, rest is all histology and all this stuff so talking about the hyperinfection um The large number of organisms in the intestines and lungs in patients with hyperinfection syndrome. This is hyperinfection syndrome may result in some, what you can say, some features. Um, starting from abdominal pain, okay. They may have nausea, vomiting. So see, I'm thinking about like the parasites in the abdomen. So that's why I'm talking about this one. Diarrhea. Okay. Sometime intestinal obstruction can be there. Okay. And uh, duodenal ulcers can form. So when duodenal ulcers will form, of course, there will be hemorrhage. Right. It can lead to perforation, very serious problem, even peritonitis, of course, of perforation. And whenever like the too much larva are present in the lungs, so the patient may present with cough, hemoptysis, shortness of breath, and respiratory failure, but not so common. So the important thing over here that you know larva at this stage in this one can be found in the sputum of the patient as well. Okay, the larva can be found in this thing. So this thing is important guys uh, in this one. So I told you what is the process of auto infection and what is hyper infection right. Like uh, uh, you can say that due to intestinal perforation which results in the larva or the flariform larva to go back in the gut of the larva. So, uh, simply like these things can occur. And sometimes the virus, the not the virus, sorry, this parasite can reach to other, other parts of the body as well, like it can reach to the brain, for example. So, it can lead to meningitis. Okay, or you can say, I'm talking about this one, I should put in one more category called as when the condition is disseminated. Disseminated means what like widely spread, you know, in the blood, in the body. So it can lead to meningitis, it can lead to pneumonia, okay. 
uh, it can lead to like XYZ type of thing. So like this, right? So these are, see, first of all, the larva will enter the skin, then reach the lungs, then reach the intestine. And if the load is too much, so there will be hyperinfection syndrome. So how we go for the diagnosis for these patients? Diagnosis of uh, strongyloid stercoralis. <laughs> so again from this one, you know the diagnosis, one thing is to see this thing in stool as well as in sputum as well as I told you. So of course like one of the tests we can do is like stool examination. Uh, stool microscopy will be better one by the way okay stool microscopy of course like uh, uh, experienced parasitologists or pathologists are going to see that thing in the stools okay but the larva are not produced too much guys so you know it can really need very much experience or sometimes it can go missed as well so and it's not like this, like even a single sample of the stool will show the parasite, rather you can say repeated tests can be done. So this thing can be done. Uh, see, you can do CBC. Eosinophilia will be there, right? Eosinophilia will be there. But nowadays, you know, a variety of methods are there to find or to make the diagnosis. For example, we can do culture of the stool as well, right? So this thing and uh, basically when we uh, put the stool on the agar, agar medium, you know, the larva can crawl over the agar, okay? So this thing, this is what you can say quite uh, useful method, but it is time consuming. Now most of the laboratories, they utilize a Lugol iodine staining technique of the stool sample. Okay. They, they use what? They use a Lugol iodine staining to identify the organism. So this thing can be done. Um, now um, we can take the sample from the duodenum directly as well, where you know they are embedded in the mucosa. But of course, you can say this is like quite uh, difficult. Okay, serological tests are also there. Serological tests are also there. And uh, of course, like uh, ELISA can be done. Okay, like the serological test, of course, like they are, they are the same one, you can say, in all this condition, ELISA can be done. And uh, they have a good sensitivity. But specificity is come because, you know, there could be a cross reactivity between other helminth infection. Uh, there is one test, or you can say, uh, immediate hypersensitivity test is also skin test skin test is also available okay for this one but again like there is a lot of cross reactivity between this these ones so microscopy can be done simply cbc can be done and uh, stool culture can be done Serological tests can be done. Um, now, even radiological imaging can be done, but uh, not for diagnosis, but to see uh, if there is any changes in the lungs and things like this, right? So this is how we check this thing. Now, what is the treatment of this condition, guys? Treatment. So the treatment or the goal of the treatment is to eradicate, finish this organism from the body. So unlike, you know, the hookworm infections, like where we can reduce the worm burden. But in this one, you know, there's the auto infection thing. So we have to eradicate that. 
So the drug we use for this thing is called as Ivermectin. Okay, Ivermectin. This is the drug for choice. So it's an oral drug they gave once daily for two days. And Albendazole, you know, that group, you can say Thaya Bendazole. It is equally effective. But it has more side effects. So Ivermectin is the best, best drug. Albendazole, you can use Albendazole. Albendazole. Albendazole can be used, right? So Albendazole require more days of treatment. But if anyone have hyperinfection, so they should be treated either with ivermectin or with thiobendazole. But in hyperinfection, um, treatment is needed, is done for at least two weeks. Okay. So this thing. So we can administer this drug either from the nasogastric tube or either per rectum in patients unable to tolerate oral medication. And if possible, like in hyperinfection, we stop immunosuppressive drug treatment if they are taking. Okay. But some of the patients we cannot stop that, of course, right? So this thing is uh, all about uh, this one. And guys, simply to avoid this condition like how we can prevent you know like we always discuss what are the preventions so remember guys again the first thing will be improve sanitation that is the first thing we can do of course by improved sanitation your feces will cannot reach the soil and avoid Soil contact, of course, one of the thing. And one thing is treatment of all of the cases. That can help. Preventation, I don't know why I always write preventation, prevention, preventions, okay. So that's all guys for about this one, uh, Strongylite Stercoralis. And uh, I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you for listening. I hope you understand.